It's time for us to do something. G'day and welcome to Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello, and uh, we're starting to get into a bit of a routine with this show. Uh, it's the third time we're doing it on a Monday uh, at uh, the beginning of the day, daytime. Uh, we experimented with uh, first thing in the morning. Now we're doing after lunch just to give us a bit more time to do the pre-production that's that's necessary. Um, so the point of today and Pello Talk is to talk about anything and everything to do with culture, society, politics, and uh, the goal is to help Australian voters, especially those who uh, don't feel reflected by everything on the ABC commentariat, uh, to be more informed, uh, be more involved and be more empowered as, as voters and contributors to the great Australian democracy, uh, which may be of a lower quality than it was a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, uh, today we're going to be talking about the World Economic Forum, our uh, masters and overlords in Davos and the great new plan they have to incentivize us to eat uh, less carbon dioxide intensive food. Uh, it's a social credit system you're going to love every detail of. We're also going to just have a bit of an update on what the election undeclared seats, how the Senate race is going. Is freedom going to uh, have any kind of uh, success? Um, and uh, what the final composition of the parliament may look like. Then we're going to talk and probably spend most of our program talking about other aspects that uh, we as uh, right-thinking voters need to be aware of. And I think one of the most important conversations we need to have today and ongoing is how can the minor party uh, voters and micro-party voters on the right wing better cooperate to get a, a better concentration of votes, a better flow of preferences, uh, do we just need to get the marble video out there or do we need to join um, join parties? So there's a lot of uh, suggestions and pros and cons to all the suggestions. But uh, let's introduce the panel right now here in the studio. I have uh, Dr. John Humphreys, the Chief Economist from the uh, Australian Taxpayers Alliance. Welcome, John. G'day, Dave. Good to be here. Uh, hopefully we'll make this a, a little bit more uh, common as well. So, and uh, joining me in the uh, studio in Sydney is Alexandra Marshall. Ellie Melly, welcome to Pello Talk. Thank you. You didn't tell them that the reason you had to move the show later is because I don't wake up before like 11 because I'm a vampire. So <laughs> That's right. We're catering to the vampires who are not so friendly at first crack of dawn. Um, <laughs> the, the night dwellers. Uh, so we've got our first comment here. Charles O says, Hey, Dave, um, thanks for watching, Charles, and to all the viewers who are, are watching, uh, please do join us with your comments. We'd love to have a chat about them. If you've got some ideas, uh, questions or, or feedback uh, for us, uh, we would love to have a chat about it. Um, no, we're not going to talk about how changing the seal of the Commonwealth is going to solve all the problems in Australian society, but uh, anything else we can, we can talk about. Uh, please share the video, and we would love to... Uh, just get more viewers involved in this conversation and dilute the power of the lying harlot media. Um, Jan says, time for coffee and a pillow talk. Um, indeed, Jan, thank you for uh, joining us. Now, Ellie, can you please tell us um, a bit about uh, the WEF? What is this social credit system that has to do with our cuisine? Well, it started with COP26 when the United Nations, uh, remember how they had a big get-together and part of the menu items they had listed down the side of the menus, the carbon value of each meal for all of these diplomats that were over there at COP26. Now, that was actually calculated by a set of companies who are now making a fortune out of what is essentially public money uh, in order to calculate what the carbon credit is of every food uh, that you choose to eat. Now, that idea has been taken over to the World Economic Forum, and they are now devising basically this way of tracking your carbon output so they can link that with the carbon choices you have in your food. The idea being, of course, that you get rewarded for making uh, carbon low choices at lunch and you get punished for making carbon heavy choices. So, the idea it's how they sold the Chinese social credit system to the youth in China. So, Think back a few years ago when China was trialling their social credit system. They said they offered the young people of China, hey, use this app and if you, act, if you act virtuously and you make good decisions, we'll give you rewards. The government will give you access to things you can't currently have, et cetera, et cetera. And then in a few short months, it became a system of punishment 
where if you said the wrong thing or you did the wrong thing, you bought the wrong thing, suddenly your kids couldn't go to school, you couldn't travel and you couldn't work. That's the same idea that the World Economic Forum is pretty much putting in place here with carbon credits against food where if you side-eye a steak or have an extra Big Mac, well, possibly that will deduct from your petrol allowance for that month. This is what they're bringing in. It's basically a carbon-based social credit system for the West. And I guarantee you that idiot teenagers will think it's a great idea to uh, be rewarded for a salad wrap at lunch um, and without even thinking what it means for the rest of society. How does that actually, um, I guess, what's the, what's the path from, I mean, what's, what's the rewards that they're talking about if you're, um, if you're getting this reward with the social credit system? What's the incentive? So the World Economic Forum link it in with the wonderful digital identity, which our own government has been trying to implement. So with digital identity, everything you do gets tallied into uh, sort of like a point scoring system against yourself. And don't forget your bank accounts are linked into your driver's license, linked into your online purchases, etc. So the idea is that when you swipe and tap and buy your salad wrap, that gives you a credit score from your carbons so that goes against your digital ID. Now, your digital ID is then used to buy other things. So they can use that to uh, warn you, first of all, about your carbon outputs, which I'm sure it'll start with a system of um, saying, oh, you know, get extra frequent, frequent flyer points if, you, uh, if you've if got a low carbon credit score or something ridiculous like that. But I guarantee they'll eventually use it to uh, punish you <clears throat> on what you can and can't buy, uh, which has been suggested by various members of the futurists over there at the forum. They're crazy people and don't think they won't go there because they've already started with businesses where they punish businesses with their carbon output. And that wasn't voted on, that wasn't elected, they just started doing it. So there's no reason to believe they won't start doing it through the uh, digital identity course. Well, I'm looking forward to a thriving black market in steaks and hamburgers. <laughs> well, we're a farmer. <laughs> I'm a farmer. I'll sell you steaks. <laughs> I, so you can have my steaks. No, but if you are going to be, because they're going to be tracking it through your, uh, through your purchases, so firstly, everyone, make sure you keep using cash. That's going to be crucially important over the coming decades, I think. Keep using cash. I uh, hate that idea because I really love using the convenience. Oh, no, I love the convenience too. I, I've, I fail on following this advice all the time. I've just got to make sure that I use cash sometimes so that my purchasing records aren't entirely trackable. So there's just, just a few random things that I, I pay in cash to, to, to mix it up a little bit. Um, look, it, it's not that important now, but these sort of things are just indicative of why it may be important to the future that our uh, convenience in the moment is, is, look, right now it's certainly convenient and mm. the easier thing to do. Uh, if, if we keep going down these paths, we may want to have alternative ways to be able to buy our stakes in the future. Because it seems like this is, uh, it, it does seem stupid. It does seem something worth railing against. It also seems something uh, pretty easy to get around, at least for the moment. Mm. Uh, Can I just say, we we thought the exact same thing about vaccine passports. If you said to somebody 10 years ago, if you don't get the latest vaccine, you won't be allowed to go to the shops and you won't be allowed to go to school or you'd be locked in your home. Would you have thought that was completely mental? It mm. shows you how fast this stuff can be implemented and how little resistance there is to it. Yeah. Yes, although again, with that, I mean that's another good example because that's also pretty easy to get around. The number of people using fake uh, Vax passports and, uh, and fake little sign-in apps was pretty high. But uh, I agree, it's something to worry about. Uh, it's just uh, the, there is an ongoing technological arms war between authoritarians trying to pin us down and people trying to be free. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out with freedom technology. It's it's so uh, common that. Um... I, I just there's so many discussions going on in society, even in the last month, um, like leading up to the election, uh, there were so many policies announced, and and then in recent news headlines, uh, there's other uh, things which have been discussed and debated, and people are forgetting that uh, you know three months ago they were libertarian. They were saying you know what government doesn't have the right to compel my behavior or to ban my behavior. Uh, my choices are mine. You stick in your place, you leave me alone. If I'm not hurting anybody else, leave me alone. Uh, you know, Don't tell me when I can go to work. Don't tell me what medicine I have to take. Don't tell me I have to wear a mask. Don't tell me I have to check in. Mind your own business. And, and then all of a sudden, we've got freedom parties coming out with uh, policies that 
tell you, well, you can't invest in superannuation that's overseas because it's unpatriotic. I'm like, well, it's my money. I'll invest it where I expect the greatest return yeah. on investment. And 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 th and that's just one example. But there were so many others. And and this is again just the same thing. It's guys. Every time we ask the government to help us, we lose a little bit more of our freedom. And I think a little bit more of our souls, and I don't think that's being too dramatic. But it is a common theme. I but, mean, uh, it, as a libertarian uh, amongst my cohort, sometimes we look out and we see a moment that looks like a libertarian moment. But so often it's an example of freedom for me, but not for thee. Uh, so we, uh, with, with my Lib Dems hat on, uh, sometimes people suggest, well, why can't you just get the legalized cannabis people to all join your party and everyone from the shooters and fishers to join your party? What they don't seem to realize is the shooters really, they only want one particular sort of freedom. The cannabis mob only wants one particular sort of freedom. Mm. There was a bunch of recent uh, allies to my cause who wanted a specific sort of anti-mandate, anti-lockdown freedom. And on that, I agree with them. But that doesn't necessarily mean they fully internalize the argument. Uh, I've, I've made the case before that what, what I want to pitch to the world is distrust people selling you big scare stories used to justify money and power for government. Now, COVID is one example of that. Global warming is one example of that. I would say overly strict uh, gun laws and drug laws or other examples of that. Yep. Uh, but I don't want people to only learn it in COVID. I want them to learn that lesson if possible. The the idea of distrusting centralized authority, trying to scare you into giving them more power. Yep. Can, can I say that uh, one of the biggest problems that humanity has is that we are highly adaptive. So the boiling frog metaphor about how they can inch up one restriction after another is actually a symptom of humanity being easily adapted to bad situations. It's how we survive. So if it gets colder, if it gets hotter, if we lose our food, if we have to move, humans are able to deal with disasters and sort of acclimatise themselves to it and then try and make mm -hmm. the best out of that. Now, governments exploit that by taking away freedom after freedom after freedom. And after a few months, humans go, oh, well, this is how it is now. And they start to forget what it was like before because if we don't do that in nature then we'll obviously we'd be very depressed animals but we have to be aware of that uh, behavior that we have when it comes to government because government will keep ratcheting on until they have absolute power yeah i don't disagree with any of that but it does remind me of another thought that humans also have the tendency that, to then sometimes catastrophize when things don't go our way uh, albanese government is now in play i think some people have reacted quite dramatically to that Melodramatically. Don't, melodramatically to that. Uh, don't forget, <laughs> humans are very adaptable. And that means we will also adapt around bad policy coming from the government. I, you see this specifically, I think, with uh, global warming debates, where, where one side uh, dramatically underestimates the ability of humans to adapt to, to rising temperatures. So I think temperatures will rise. I think we're causing it. And I don't think it's a drama. I think it's fine. We'll adapt. That's my position. Uh, and I think agree. the thing people underestimate is exactly what uh, Ellie was saying there, the, the human capacity for adaption. There's a flip side to that as well. I think people sometimes overestimate the costs of AGW policy. Now, I don't think there should be any. I think all global warming policy, carbon taxes, carbon trading systems, subsidies, et cetera, I think they all fail a benefit cost test. But I also don't think that they're a, the end of civilization because, again, humans are remarkably adaptable creatures and we mm. will adapt to that bad policy. But as you say, the problem with adapting to bad policy is you end up uh, the government gets off the hook for introducing the bad policy. Well, the, the cry... The, the people who uh, catastrophize, as you say, that's a cry for help. And so in order to combat our genetic ability to just adapt, you have a small percentage of population, it's usually only about 8%, who will, who will see something coming and try and alert the others to danger. They're not always right. Sometimes they're wrong. But people who have started freaking out about Albanese government might be the people who are in serious debt after the COVID years and they can see interest rates rising and they can see what's going to be a catastrophe. And that is what the problem is. So you have to understand the difference between people who catastrophize for the purpose of personal profit, like governments and uh, the scientific community who are making a, an absolute fortune out of climate catastrophe. And then there's the ordinary citizens who see a massive problem on the horizon and try and be the standouts in the crowd going, hey, I don't think we should lock people in their homes if they refuse to have an injection. That's the difference. Yep. Well, the, the in instinct to catastrophize is also one that's probably been quite evolutionarily advantageous through history. The, uh, the people who weren't scared of the saber-toothed tiger probably died off much quicker than the people who were worried. So we humans seem to have an instinct to worry, but then we have to hope that our the rational parts of our brain kick in so that we only react to the, the fears that are, are very real. Alan M. Stra Stas says, the biggest lie around today that needs to be broken is the government is here to look after us. 
Amen, Alan. Elaine, I'm sorry, should I say Elaine? Uh, truth is the government is here to provide the ability for us to look after ourselves. Yeah, I, I guess that's my philosophy too, is um, that the government should be not r restricting us or limiting us, but uh, to clear the way for us, um, to be self-reliant and, and dependent on each other. I think there's been a bit of over-dramatisation of the word interdependent. Um, I don't think nations should be interdependent, but I do think people um, benefit from a large degree of interdependency. I think community is a natural and or God-designed um, solution. And I think that, and, and if you don't want to use the word interdependence, then let's use the word community. Um, that That is the far better solution for most of the problems. And I, I think this is one of the things that needs to be deprogrammed, even amongst right-wingers, is that we've got this habit, and, and, and you talk about any policy area, like when it came to medication and personal risk management, there was a, a lot of people who got that we should look after ourselves, that risk is a, an individual thing, one size fits all is terrible policy, and, and we should have a great deal of government should get out of the road. And the less they do, the better for everyone. Um, but they throw that paradigm out the window on just about every other policy uh, area. And, and it's insane. Like, well, look, I mean, yeah, superannuation, get out of the road. I'm, I'm, I have become so, um, so convinced that government is just a, a, a <laughs> the worst, should be the, the, the solution of last resort to every question, the answer of last resort to every question. It's not about, uh, about government at all. I think my, my take on that is just that I would like to see there be a higher level of instinctive scepticism of centralised political power. I mean, sometimes it may be necessary. Sometimes it may be the least bad option. Yes. But I just want people to start with a much higher level of scepticism. By the way, one quick way of helping people get on that train is the next time you hear somebody saying uh, the government should, the government order, the government should spend, the government should control, just re-say their sentence back to them and change the word government to politicians. Yeah. Politicians and bureaucrats should. Politicians and bureaucrats should control my health, control my decisions, control my spending, control my savings. Yeah. Uh, and that, I think, sometimes helps people get that instinctive, wait a second, are you sure? Yeah. No, I'm not sure. That's my point. <laughs> Yeah, I disagree with you with some extent. I'm not a true, I'm not an absolute pure libertarian. I think government's role in general, just the government as a concept, the reason we invented government was for civilizations to succeed. Now, there are different ways that governments can operate to uh, achieve that end goal. And the competition between civilizations means that some of these political systems are going to succeed and others aren't. Now, the libertarian style that uh, we inherited from England is not a common system of government. We are, we are quite rare that we have a system of government that gives us liberty. And it's not necessarily the most successful system. I mean, a lot of these heavily regulated civilizations, they do expand, they do gain more power. So as far as that goal is concerned, they succeed. The question we have to ask ourselves is what kind of government do we want to live in? And what kind of society do we want to have? So in that respect, I've always viewed government as being basically responsible for making sure that we remain sovereign, that foreign powers and entities don't corrupt our sovereign uh, nation and, and what we already have, and to level the, the playing game as much as possible and make it as fair as possible for individuals in society and also to catch those individuals that fall right through. I mean, we don't want to have a civilization that just says, oh, you're really poor, too bad. We do need to have some safety nets for citizens to give them a second chance. But apart from yeah. that, they should be as lenient as possible when it comes to how we run our country. Can I just add one other I guess, thought experiment for people to run to hopefully uh, instill a greater level of instinctive scepticism? And I'm not saying no government, Ellie. It's, uh, sometimes they are the least bad option on the table. I get that. But I think instinctive scepticism is healthy. Uh, especially of bureaucrats and politicians. But, but one other uh, approach to this is consider whenever you give the government power, and you named a bunch of uh, situations where it could well be a good idea to give the government power. Um, but before you give the government power, consider what would Sarah Hansen Young do with this power? <laughs> what would Anthony Albanese do with this power? What would my political enemies? Because unless yeah. we're creating dictatorship and we're controlling it forever, yeah. eventually your political enemies are going to have the exact powers you thought that you right. needed now. No, I, I, no I'm, I'm, say, I'm saying don't... I'm saying don't sell all of our ports to China and I'm saying don't allow 
foreign nations to own all of our farmland and all of our property and leave Australians as renters in their own land. That's what I'm saying the government's role primarily is and to defend us from foreign threats. That's really what their role is. Um, to your point, John, um, the language I put around that is is that the laws we create or add um, which are designed by us to control bad people will be used one day by bad people mm -hmm. to control us. And, and that is just, if you don't know enough history, that is a fundamental, inescapable, historical eventuality that if you just leave government alone long enough, it's going to be, and I said this at the beginning of the pandemic, I had good Christian friends who believed nearly everything the same as I do, but they were totally in favour of trusting the government and, and giving them the powers to, to make these decisions. I'm like, let's even just assume for a second that this government doesn't get drunk or misuse these powers, drunk on or misuse this, this new extravagant absolute power that we're giving them, violating natural freedoms left, right and centre. Let's just assume they can be trusted. How do you know even five governments from now, ten governments from now, that eventually these precedents that we are establishing, even if they're not legislated, simply by us cooperating, we're giving them the precedent that they only need to say emergency or mm. say science and they can they can trample whatever freedoms we have right now. The powers that we give governments to do good now uh, to prevent bad things or bad people will be used by bad people in government eventually to control good things and good people. And it, the extra point to that is it's not even random. I mean, if you allocated power randomly, eventually bad people will get it. But it's not even randomly allocated because think of the sort of person who has this uh, innate desire to control other people. That person gets to the top of politics and bureaucracy. So yep. it's the, the, the game is kind of, and that's not to say all politicians are mindless hacks. There's plenty of good people who make a sacrifice to go into politics. But the, it attracts a certain kind of power-hungry power hungry megalomaniac. So mm. it's, it's not a totally random allocation. You're, you're giving power generally to the people who you least want to have it. Yep. And there's, a, there's an old I, idiom I, that's not correct, but the idioms are still quite good. If, if people are mostly good, you don't need a big government. If people are mostly bad, you don't want a big government full of people. So yeah, either way, uh, you're sceptical of government. Sorry, Ellie. I, I've actually changed my mind a lot during the pandemic, having seen what's happened. I know I quote Jonathan Sumption a lot, but basically we talk about the laws that we create and the power that we give and what's become painfully obvious during the pandemic is it doesn't matter what legal protections we have against politicians, what our constitution says or what our high courts decided previously. Once a politician and the opposition decide that they're going to pass new laws to deal with whatever they want in an emergency situation, they just pass them. They changed fundamental things about our government in states and across Australia during the pandemic with barely any discussion. And when it was challenged in court, the courts basically said, it's not our problem. If everyone's in agreement, we're just going to do it. So my point would be that government is not really controlled by the laws at all. It's controlled by the psyche of the people who sit beneath government. So if we all object to having our freedoms uh, curtailed, then politicians aren't able to do it because it's unpopular. But if we all ask for help, then that facilitates bad government. So it's really up to the type of people that society cultivates and how we educate people to do with what sort of government we end up with. Yeah. Now, it would be predictable that I would say this, but just because it's predictable doesn't mean it's wrong. But I think uh, some of this is uh, a manifestation of a problem that's already built up in our culture over decades, and that is the government is already, in my opinion, far too big. A government of this size was always going to have the capacity and therefore an emergency, you know, an instinct, a willingness to go too far and trample our liberties. Yep. So I would say, you know, decades ago, and the liberty movement's been saying this not for two years, but for decades, uh, that we needed to shrink the government so that they weren't in a position to do this. So uh, I would say that recent years has been a, a vindication of that argument. That yep. My concern is, and this is a, a little bit of a civil war going on in the right of politics, especially in America, and I think we're importing a bit of it, is there's two reactions when you see a, a big government do a bunch of things you don't like. One reaction is that government is too big. We need to shrink their powers, you know, wholesale, significantly, so they can't easily do things like this. The other one is that that government is big and powerful and doing things I don't like. I want control of it. Now, that, that is uh, an instinct on some parts of the populist or authoritarian right, which I think is a dangerous instinct. Uh, and I don't think that path leads us to a good place civilizationally. Would you, would, you not, would you not say that you need to take power in order to change the law? Because one problem that I see, and I would like to know your thoughts on this, 
Take the emergency legislation, for example. These have long had sunset clauses on them and very strict time limits to say that you cannot, a premier cannot extend an emergency past a certain point. Now, that was just changed without any real effort. So if you're not in charge of government, how on earth do you, can you get the power required to reverse some of these decisions and to shrink the government if you're not in a position of power to do so? Yeah, I'm not arguing against uh, the, the need for legislative change, which obviously needs a majority in a parliament to do it. Or to be it's the just, legislator. Uh, or, or to be the legislator, and we should invite uh, Alex Antic and, and Jared Rennick back on at some stage, uh, and they can make their case that uh, Ellie and I should give up our parties and join them. But uh, no, I'm not making the case against that. I, I'm saying that when you have power, then how do you use it? One way is just to turn the weapons on the enemy. All right, so the Democrats used the, uh, the, the tax office in America, the American Democrats. They used the tax office against Republicans. Well, one response could be that the Republicans, when in power, use the tax office against the Democrats. The other response is you significantly decrease the power of the tax office. So those are two different, qualitatively different ways to react once you have power. Mm. Uh, and the, the libertarian right would argue that you need to dramatically shrink the size of government just so that, I mean, they're still going to get up to stuff that I don't want them to when they're in power. But if they just have less money, if they have fewer regulations available to them, fewer uh, revenues that they can increase, uh, yep. fewer precedents that they can rely on, they will still get up to trouble. I still won't like it, but they'll, I think, get up to less trouble. I have that sounds like uh, a seminar that I'm planning um, with Senator Rennick. We're going to be doing, uh, essentially giving him a, a large platform in the next couple of months to talk about the reasons he joined politics, and that essentially is um, political reform, reforming um, the financial institutions and the uh, the bureaucratic institutions, oh, sorry, the... Uh, the legislator, I'm not sure the exact word, but bodies like um, the the ABC, the Department of Meteorology, uh, the Bureau of Meteorology, sorry, um, the, the Reserve Bank, there's all these legislated bodies which are not politically accountable, laws unto themselves, and, and they've become a very uh, weaponized, <clears throat> really, part of, of implementing agendas in Australia. And, and um, that's going to be very interesting. Uh, let me tell you, there's another uh, seminar that's planned coming up soon. I'm, I'm hoping to actually get a convention centre to be able to do it. Um, it's going to require a lot of uh, either ticket price or donations to, uh, to hire such a big venue. But uh, we're going to be talking about the WEF. We're going to be explaining uh, Davos, the World Economic Forum, um, the, the fourth industrial revolution as, as theorised and, and envisioned and promoted by Klaus Schwab. Um, and we're going to have uh, Senator Malcolm Roberts, uh, George Christensen, and probably others like uh, Avi Yemeni along. It's going to be a fantastic large conference, um, evening seminar. Uh, that's going to be something to actually uh, look out for as soon as possible. We're just putting together the logistics right now so we can... Uh, claim a date and and sell some tickets and uh, unfortunately it won't be free unless there's a heck of a lot of donations but um, it uh, is something that's critically important right now that we have as much voter education on as possible um, so that we're informed uh, and involved. Uh, speaking of voter involvement let's pivot to the election results. John, you've been keeping an eye on the Senate race in particular and, and how the count is going. Um, is One Nation going to pick up Pauline Hanson's seat and any others? Uh, and uh, what's the final crossbench of the Senate going to look like with whatever degree of confidence you can tell us right now? Yes, well, uh, the most of the media's uh, had a very close eye on, I had notes here, uh, a very close eye on the lower house, as you would expect. Uh, and it looks like Labor's going to get that 76 seats that everyone else is aiming for. Uh, of course, the crossbench will support them in government anyway, so it's somewhat of a moot point. Uh, but that's been the focus, understandably. Uh, my focus is more often on the Senate. I find that quite an interesting one. Mm. Uh, and less people give us updates. Uh, it's looking like, uh, as we actually did, we discussed this on the night, so we, our prediction was roughly right on the night of the election coverage. It looks like Labor plus the Greens will get to 38. You need 39 to pass legislation through the Senate. It looks like Labor will be on 26, the Greens on 12, getting them 38, so one short. Uh, but there's going to be uh, two Lambies. Oh, the second wow. Lambie isn't called Lambie, but uh, look, that's not certain yet, but it looks Lambie likely uh, Lambie's uh, staffer is going to come in as a second Lambie-esque Lambie independent. And then there is uh, David Pocock from the ACT, a Teal senator. 
So, de facto, so in Tasmania, everyone... Jackie Lambie's staffer is is run in her off election. Yep. Um, she's likely to get up giving Jackie Lambie control of two votes in the Senate. Yes, although the Labor will only need one of them to be able to pass legislation. Just to clarify again, I'm, I'm sure your listeners already know this, but uh, just to clarify, there's 12 senators from each state. Only six are up for election uh, at each election. Yep. So elections every three years, but senators are elected for six years uh, and only half elected each time. So Jackie Lambie uh, was elected in the last election. She wasn't up for election now. So she's, she's got, got another three years. Another three years on her now term. An but now she's got, uh, she ran someone under her name, her party, Jackie Lambie Network or team, something yeah. like that. And, and they got elected. So now there's two Jackie Lambies in Tasmania. Is there any chance? Is there a path well, to victory for Topher or Erica Betts? Uh, there is. Um, yeah, that, the preference flows uh, would have to be monumentally uh, consistent. So look, th theoretically, technically, you can still add up the numbers and get it there. Realistically, it's very, very unlikely. So uh, I don't want to give anyone false hope. I mean, I look at the numbers and I want that outcome. I want Topher in the Senate. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I look at it with motivated reasoning and I think, oh, look, I can make the numbers add up. But for those numbers to add up, Nearly everyone would have to preference the way I want them to, and mm. humans are uh, stubbornly refuse to do what I want them to do. Sometimes, <laughs> so, uh, I'd like I'd like to know why Jackie Lambie is even allowed to be running in Senate after she said she was going to come after the Australian people lock, stock, and barrel. I would have thought there'd be an instant fail as a senator to say stuff like that. Yeah, the rules are different depending on what side of politics you're on, uh, unless Nothing. it's popular. She's uh, she's yeah. firmly in the Labor column there, which means she's firmly in the mainstream media column. So I think you get let off. Yeah, much more than. Yeah, well, people. I just, I, I just think that's absolutely disgusting that we're still letting people be elected and hold office when they basically threaten the citizens they're supposed to represent. To me, that would be a sorry, you're out. That's a you need to find somebody else to put in that place. Yeah. So I did absolutely. have another little update on some of the other states. We talked before about a so-called freedom-friendly minor party or a minor right party potentially picking up spots uh, in each state. Uh, that's looking increasingly less likely as this as the count goes on. Uh, although those spots probably won't go to a left-wing party, the Liberals are doing quite well on late counts. Uh, so the, in, in Victoria, there was talk that uh, possibly the last spot would go to a UAP candidate, and it still might happen, right? We have to wait to see how those preferences are allocated. But uh, currently the Liberal candidate, Liberals number, third, number, number three, the third candidate on their Senate ticket, mm -hmm. uh, I think Greg Mirabella in Victoria, is currently in front of the UAP. So we'll wait and see how that plays out, but that could be another Liberal, one fewer UAP. Wow. Uh, the South Australian race could have been One Nation or UAP. Uh, and that's the Liberal count is going up there as well. And the Labor count is going up there. So okay. Liberal and Labor now in front of UAP and One Nation. Again, we don't know how preferences play. Uh, looks like WA's last spot will go to Labor's number three. Looks like New South Wales' last spot will go to Jim Molan, the Liberal number three. Okay. Uh, looks like he'll be re-elected. Yep. And one that's particularly interesting um, and this one's way too early to call, uh, it may not happen, but uh, Amanda Stoker, the Liberal number three in Queensland, has significantly caught up with Pauline Hanson. Wow. So just a few days ago, I was looking at these numbers. Uh, Pauline had a, a, about a 3% lead on primary vote. Uh, this morning I checked again, it was, yesterday I checked it was 0. 0.8, this morning it was 0. 0.5, wow. and I just checked it's 0. 0.3. So that uh, lead is getting very close. It'll, we'll have to see what happens with preferences though, because Pauline had quite a nice preference flow uh, sorted out for Queensland. Mm. And to the degree that people follow those, that might save her. But it's getting a very close fight now in Queensland. Sorry, Ellie. I really hope that Amanda Stoker doesn't get in. I know she's the darling of the right, but when I was sitting down there in Parliament, I actually watched her giggle and laugh when uh, One Nation was trying to pass some of these protections against the vaccine harm that were going on. And she just crossed the floor and sat with Labor and Liberal, laughing away as uh, some of these minor parties try desperately to protect the people. So that just disappoints me. I, I lost a lot of respect when I saw that happening. And I really hope that we get Pauline in there. So at least there's a few voices in Parliament that are still trying to protect people. Well, I'm not uh, cheering for Amanda over uh, Pauline necessarily, although I will push back a little bit. Uh, I don't know the context of every time people laugh or what jokes they're telling. But on the whole, I found, uh, I've consistently found Amanda to be both a good person uh, and more than once she voted against any kind of vaccine protection for people. But more than once. Everybody in politics have voted many times against what I think is the right thing to do. Uh, yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm saying I, I don't want her up. I think she's a, a genuine person and a person of principle. So I'm not saying I hope she knocks out Pauline, but I, I, I was sad that the Liberals put her at number three on their ticket and her survival wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, in yeah. my opinion. 
Uh, Dylan Oakley, a frequent guest on this panel um, from the channel Freedom Has a Voice, says, thanks for that observation about Stoker. Ellie? Um, yeah, I, but it wasn't, I a, think... it wasn't passing laughter either. It was about the topic at hand. So yeah, just to be look, clear. Um, I, I think it's fair to observe that um, she hasn't been a solid conservative. Uh, she's been a little bit of a fence sitter. Um, and she shows incredible courage and bravery on some conservative issues, uh, which is rare and against the grain and certainly sticking her head above the parapets. That deserves recognition when she does that. Um, but it's also fair to observe that she's been, at best, um, <laughs> uh, diplomatic um, to the point of, of being uh, weak. On some of the other issues, I find um, it weird. Yeah, but I'm not saying she's a liberal party, but uh, she has been in the ministry recently, which doesn't allow her to cross the floor. And that's and one of the that... things I wanted to say was she will be better in opposition Senate than she will be in government Senate. And as a as a member, even a junior member of the cabinet, uh, she basically has to be muted in public. But that will not be the same in opposition. In opposition, she will be able to flex in a very helpful way. Um, and so I won't be melodramatic if she's re-elected. I'll be glad. Definitely. Well, let's better. see, let's, let's see, boys. Let's see if she actually, when given the chance, supports people's freedoms and liberties like we want her to, or if she keeps staying the party line because now she has a choice to prove herself. And I've listened to many, many interviews that she's given and she never gives any useful answers when the topic is crucial, absolutely mm. crucial to people's lives. I, I agree with you that on only easy conservative issues, and let's be frank, we're talking about easy economic issues, she's solid. But when it comes to the primary issues, when it comes to freedom and liberty that really matter, that's when she's been quiet. So let's see if she redeems herself. I'm not thinking on it, but I'll, yeah, I'm I, prepared to be I, prepared. I feel obliged to, to defend her a little bit. Of this. Look, if you're going to play we major party to politics... We move on, so final comment on no, this, John. Look, I, I'm often an advocate for playing minor party politics because I think it moves the needle more. But if you're going to play major party politics, it's pointless to go in there, throw all your prams out the window, quit and storm out. So I, I, you've got to walk the line great, great of when you can, picture. when you can uh, push push the argument internally. Uh, look, I the Liberal Party would be totally useless if it didn't have people like Alex Antic and Amanda Stoker in it. So uh, they're not going to be perfect. No one is. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad they're there. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm just going to say that that's what I really hate about party politics. Like, if you're going to be in politics and you can't stand up and defend what matters, then I'm sorry. There's no point being there. That's my belief about politics. That's I'm the old Winston Churchill style of politics. So that's where I hail from. Sorry, your turn. <laughs> Let's talk about the solution to the, uh, I guess, the, the problem that we would want is that we're not looking at either a Green, a Labor or a Liberal uh, but we would be looking at a minor party candidate. There are many people who watch this show who are Liberal voters, and thank you for being in the Liberal Party and watching the show. Um, you're the kind of people that need to be in the Liberal Party to, to I, I guess, hold back the invading hordes of Huns that from the left that are trying to totally take it over and make it a socialist party. But, you know, what if we could have Pauline Hanson or Campbell Newman or Topher Field or, or some of the other heroes of the the right-thinking, um, small government, um, genuine right-wing people in Australia, that would be fantastic. And, and so we need to actually spend the 20 minutes we've got left uh, just talking about what that might look like. Is there a realistic time for it? And, and let me set a, a context, a frame of reference for this uh, commission, that um, this might be a strategy that can be implemented over five to ten years. It might not be a what can we do this year or this election cycle. Um, let's also talk short term, but short to medium term in the in the twelve months to five years. Let's say, um, you know, if Pauline Hanson gets elected, she's got six years on on her Senate. Uh, what can the right wing parties do? Can we am amalgamate? Uh, can they uh, form a coalition? Um, should we all join the Liberal Party or should we all join and change its flavour or, or even the National Party might be a more feasible um, option? Uh, Ellie Melly, your initial thoughts? My initial thoughts are that the reason that minor parties were on the rise to start with is because the Liberal Party lost their way. The majority of the people in the Freedom Parties are ex-Liberals who were disappointed with the way that the Liberal Party had abandoned some primary values. Now, a lot of people who were convinced by fear were perfectly happy for the Liberal Party to play at big government. 
but a percentage of those were not. So the biggest threat to the minor parties is, of course, if the Liberal Party become under decent management and they remember what sort of party they're actually meant to be. And that would be the end of minor parties. And they'd go back to being single issue fringe groups. If the Liberal Party don't do that, if Dutton doesn't actually change the philosophy of the Liberal Party, then you've got to look at what the core motivation is behind having freedom parties. And I think if the freedom parties were to focus on the old Menzian ideas of liberty and conservatism and choice then and responsible economics, then they would have half a chance. And that means almost taking some of the best parts of each of the minor parties, the soul of people like One Nation, the money of the UAP, and some of the economic policies of Lib Dems, those three ideas together are a solid concept. It's just a matter of, of, of the Australian people, whether or not they decide they do still value these things or if they just lean heavier and heavier into this big government, that there's a genuine concern that the damage done by COVID and this climate change uh, education in schools has forever changed the mentality of the Australian people and their voting. They may forever want big government. We don't know. They might have become dependent on it. So it'll, it'll just depend on what happens with the fabric of society, really. Yep. Bridget, Brigitte Jones says, well said, Ellie. Uh, Rusty says, some, same core values surrounded with smoke and mirrors. Uh, Judy asks, why are you stuck in the liberal mindset, David? You seem very much intent, I guess you meant to say, on trying to save them and it being stuck to the parties we already have. Um, well, I'm not stuck in a liberal mindset. Um, I'm keeping an open mind. Um, and, and that is that all things should be on the table. Let's ex assess them on their, on their merits, pros and cons, and, um, and never close their mind to any of these options. Uh, John, I think you would agree with Judy that the, the theory of the possibility of renewing or redeeming the Liberal Party is, uh, is completely mythical, impossible and implausible. Uh, yes, and yet not always the wrong thing to do, depending on a person's personality. Look, one uh, quick uh, addendum to what Ellie said there. I fear that the, the midpoint of our culture now is trending, as you said, the wrong way towards uh, just in instinctive faith in politicians and bureaucrats and more authoritarianism. Mm. But note that to start changing politics, you don't need 50% yet. Indeed, if you already had 50%, you don't need to change it. So uh, to get into the Senate, uh, a solid point. 8 to 10% each time around, you get that for two elections across the country, 12 senators, balance of power. So it, it is the pushback is possible from minor parties. We don't need the 50% yet. We do need to coalesce around a party that can get around 10%, which we haven't done yet. So this is, I think, one of the points you were driving at, yeah. where the, the minor right vote is still standard. And to Judy's point, this is actually where I think the solution is, is in a medium party. And in fact, I think we even need to get that language um, into our head, is that stop talking minor parties. We have to, in fact, I will go be so bold as to say micro parties and minor parties are a complete waste of time. And what we have to focus on, and use this word, is a medium party. Unless we build, establish, and achieve a medium party over the next 10 years, uh, we are not going to be holding the balance of power anywhere. It, I call a, it a movement. A little bit. Um, can I please implore the people in the RDA, do not register yet another party. Oh. We do not need yet more. We've, the problem is already, now I don't know if we can get down to one or two. I, I, that might be too big a goal, but we need to stop creating additional splinters on top of the splinters. The life of Brian skit comes to mind. Mm. Uh, so I, I did like the point Ellie made there about the soul of uh, One Nation, the economics of Lib Dems and the money of UAP. I think a lot of people have, have had a, a similar daydream. I do worry, I think we've discussed this before uh, off air, that it may be hard to make that come about, uh, at least in the short term. I know we've got a, a Victorian election coming up soon, a New South Wales election coming up soon. Uh, I think a lot uh, will hinge on what happens at those elections. Let's talk about some of the impossibilities because this is a reality that um, I want to put on the table for uh, viewers to understand um, that it's not easy to conglomerate. Um, and the one example I was talking about with Topher Field on, on social media this week was um, marijuana, legalising cannabis. Um, you know, there's a debate to be had there, but there's a very large portion of the conservative minor right wing who would find that a, a, a deal breaker issue. Um, that would just be a, a stench in their nose that they couldn't swallow 
in in a conglomerated party. Um, and there, and you know, don't get obsessed about that topic. The point is those topics exist, and there might be one for you um, that that's just an absolute deal breaker. I mean, people who follow the teachings of Rod Cullerton will will think a, a constitutional um, renovation is absolutely necessary and they won't be part of anything that doesn't have that as its primary objective. Uh, there's going to be something for everybody and and this is the problem is why I, I think you're getting to is that there are some of those things that are just insurmountable. Yeah, well, there's that. There's also to some degree uh, egos that are you need to try and squeeze into to one room, which is not necessarily undoable, but it just adds a degree of difficulty. You've got different visions and histories, which you need to try and square the circle. Uh, and uh, a lot of it's going to end up depending on who actually has people in parliament as well. Look, I, I think just riffing off this a little bit, um, there's now a chance that the UAP doesn't win any seats at this election. If they don't pick up in a senator in Victoria or South Australia, it's not clear to me how how much of a future the UAP has without any senators. Won't uh, they just hibernate for three years until the next election and then inject another $100 million to... Now, I'm not in the UAP, so I may be speaking out of turn. It did appear to me they put a real effort into actually building a party this time around. Three years ago, that was less obvious. Uh, but it, it seems that they got people to join and think they were joining a party. I'm not sure what those people do. Now, the, the shell of UAP might be there, and if you add more money in three years' time, I guess you could go again. But there's, I think, uh, Clive and Craig claimed 80,000 people joined. What do they do for the next three years? Are so there that, any branch meetings, any parties? Well, I, I don't know about that. But the yeah. point is, if they, they, they were sold a bill of goods, is that uh, Clive's money can, can buy power and influence. Without that money working, why are people sticking with UAP? I mean, like I prefer the Lib Dems, obviously, to, to One Nation. But I can see why people join the Lib Dems. It's our you know, consistent small government philosophy. We didn't have money or a personality behind us, so that's why they join us. I can see why people join uh, One Nation. I mean, there's, to some degree, Pauline is a very charismatic, magnetic person that embodies what a lot of people would like to see more of in Australian politics. Yeah. I get that. I, I like uh, Ellie's reference there to the soul, the soul of One Nation, uh, and I think she brings soul to politics. So I can see why people join those parties without money. I suspect people joined UAP because they thought money would buy power, and if money doesn't buy power, why do they stay? So, uh, no, I might be wrong on that, but it'll be interesting to watch. If I, I they would, don't win a seat, I I can, I point out, can I point out something totally different to what you boys like, just totally different? We're all talking Ellie, about politics. Just, um, uh, let, I'll just inject something yeah. very brief and come straight back to you because I think you're going to move on beyond this little... Um, anyway, um, I think the reason they joined UAP was one, Craig Kelly, um, a, a very great champion of freedom and common sense, speaking out very early... On, on medical freedom to be able to choose ivermectin or, or whatever other medical treatment. His, his courage and example is, is something that people should want to be a part of, and, and that was very good. And, and essentially, Clive just built around that nucleus, I think, a, a movement for 80,000 people to want to join, that, that it was just this freedom, freedom, freedom thing. And, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's, I think, why they joined those two reasons because it was just the party for the hour that the nation um, found itself in. Ellie, sorry to interrupt. They, well, no, just to agree with you, they put Craig Kelly in the wrong position. He should have been in the Senate, the lead Senate candidate, and 100%. then we would have been in serious trouble because there's only so much you can do with his electorate, whereas all that money should have gone behind putting him in a Senate seat. And I think that my party would have been in a lot of trouble if that had been the case. Uh, but point. what I was going to say is... <laughs> One Nation. What I was going to say is that we've, we're all talking about politics, what it looks like right now. We have to think about what politics is going to look like in three years' time. So in right. three years, we're going to see some of the repercussions happening of this ultra-left green teal policy. We're going to see mm -hmm. high power prices. We're going to see high interest rates. People are going to be poor. They're going to be complaining that these green things are making their life worse, that they're losing, there might be food shortages, they might not be able to get what they want. And so if you look at politics in three years, what you're going to want are fighters, you're going to want three solid years of campaigning with the answers as to, you know, because people look for blame straight away. If their lives start becoming hard, the electorate that we're all like, oh yeah, I'm saving the world by voting teal, uh, mostly, apart from the ultra rich, most of them are going to turn around and say, I really need to be able to get my kids to school. I need to be able to feed my my parents and whatever else. And so they're going to turn around and maybe they'll look at the minor parties again and at least start to say maybe they had a point if the minor parties continue to run and dismantle this ideology of virtue that suffocated last election. Uh, so it's really 
the question of minor parties is not so much what happened last time. It's what's going to happen when the ideology that won starts to fall apart. Because if the Liberals are still tagged in to this I heart renewables and they're all still on the wrong side of history, well, then minor parties will have a chance. But if Dutton is smart and he goes the other way, then the minor parties will be in serious trouble. So our gonna, fate will be determined a lot by what the major party does. I've got a bit of bad news for us here in that uh, when, when Labor's in power and things go wrong, the instinct, and the Liberals will, will present this argument, and the instinct is to believe it, that uh, we can solve that problem by voting for the other major party. This is why it, it, my, parties of the minor right tend to do better when you have a, a failing Liberal government in power because Labor is offering a, a worse alternative. People are looking at the Liberals, and if they, they want smaller government or they want anything right-wing, they realise the Liberal government's been failing. But while in opposition... But would you say... Tend to be but would you say this is different? This is, would you say this is different, though? Because Liberals didn't offer an opposition. So in this particular case, like, you're right normally, but in this case, they ran the same line as Labor. Well, that's while they were in government. So my point is, when they're in opposition, they can allow people and encourage people to think uh, that they're going to stand for whatever those people want them to stand for. Because while in opposition, you don't have to do anything. You can just say you're going to do all things for all people. And remember, politics is won generally by, with, with all due respect to those voters, by low information voters. Uh, so uh, this is, look, I, I hope you're right. Uh, and I think the important thing from what you said there is this is an opportunity for the minor right parties to continue prosecuting the argument now. So there's a continuity from the argument we were running for the last couple of years. So I think that is quite important and showing people there's an alternative. I got to say, you're right, three years is different, but the next couple of weeks is going to be crucial in that if UAP has senators, it's a very different world for the minor right. If they don't, yeah. That's, again, different. If Pauline uh, loses her seat, and I think she's probably still in front in, in the odds, but if she does, again, that's going to really change the way we see minor right politics. It is going to change the landscape dramatically depending on how these final Senate seats run out. If Clive, if Clive Palmer, he's changed his party name, I need to give him that credit, but uh, if UAP pick up one or even two seats, um, the discussion we're having changes dramatically compared to if they don't have any seats at all. Um, same with Pauline. You know, what we're talking about, the, maybe the viability, I personally think perhaps uh, One Nation is the most viable minor party to make a medium party. Um, Can I just quickly But if on Pauline that. is not elected, yeah. that changes dramatically. That You're now look, looking for a new figurehead. Is it going to be Mark Latham? Uh, would George Christensen, uh, you know, lead the party from outside parliament or, or some other personalities. Um... Well, Malcolm Roberts is still there. But yeah, no, that was the point I was going to say. If Pauline gets up and, and the Lib Dems look very unlikely and UAP is now looking a bit unlikely, but if Pauline gets up, One Nation keeps two senators, then they do become the obvious go-to. Not by me. Uh, I'll be sticking with the Lib Dems, but I, I can understand with my objective sort of political commentary hat on that they will be kind of representing the minor right in Parliament. I think uh, if Topher Field wins Senate seat in Tasmania, we all join the Lib Dems and make that the medium party. Do you agree, Ellie? <laughs> <laughs> if I was in Tasmania, I'd probably vote for Topher. Let's put it that way. But uh, yeah, exactly right. Maybe we can but, recruit uh, some of uh, you know Erica Betts and uh, some of the rogue. Uh, coalition members well, to... Sounds to, like we're can, starting the Free State Project. Why don't we all... Can, 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 I, can I say that the one thing we could all agree on is that the minor parties need charisma. They need strong leaders who know what they're talking about, who can get up on, on the screen day after day and prosecute the case and really go after the major parties, their ideology, the little cult of victimhood and guilt and show the Australian people what's going on and what they can do to fix the future that's been presented to them. And only if they've got some soul, some personality, some charisma. I'm sorry, Lib Dems. You just need to have a little bit more, um, uh, what do you call it, a little bit more oomph in your uh, discussions. I think you can get people on board with your economics if they are made to care yeah. about it. And the, the One Nation probably needs to have a little more detail. And UAP needs to find someone that's not Clive Palmer to uh, lead the campaign. And that way, I think the whole message will get about much more. Because don't forget, we don't get the media. We don't get the privilege of having coverage on mainstream networks. All that happens is people hear how crap we are day after day by people who have got vested interest in getting rid of us. So it just one takes the, strength uh, and personality. One of the most charismatic Lib Dem candidates, uh, Diane Dimitri, uh, is applauding you with clap icons and says, well well said, Ellie. Let me put a, a theory to the panel, and uh, we, we now have to bring this home in the next five minutes and, and land this thing. But let me... 
let me put a, a strategy out there that I think is probably the most plausible strategy. So shoot me down when I finish. Um, what if over the next three years we forget about conglomerating anything and we forget about choosing one of the significant minor parties to migrate voters to? What if we just said, let's look at the Senate results and be very scientific about this. The three freedom parties that got the most votes uh, across Australia are the One Nation Party, the United Australia Party and the Liberal Democrats Party, which needs a new name. Let's abandon, as voters, let's abandon the micro parties that achieve nothing and do nothing. We'll never shut them down and we'll never empty them. Some people will always, you know, faithfully, loyally stick to them despite the improbable possibilities of them getting anywhere. But what if we all made a concerted effort to see which of the three minor parties that actually has a chance of getting people elected, which of those rises to the top? But at the very least, over the next three party, over the next three years, we make One Nation, UAP and Lib Dems uh, bigger than they are already. Stop this splintering with new parties and micro parties and more new parties uh, with personalities and influences at the front. And what if we then have a look at, with those three parties being the serious magnet for most freedom voters, hopefully 90% of freedom voters, what if we get them, and John, this is your idea, so I'll give you credit for this, what if we get them in a Senate grouping so that uh, so that they share the top spot around the different states. In Queensland, you might have One Nation at the top. In uh, New South Wales, you might have uh, UAP at the top. And in Victoria, you have Lib Dems at the top and, and variously like that. But we actually put them in one group, like a coalition, not conglomerated, but just cooperating and a coalition to Then you're only having to hand out one how-to-vote card in, in each state saying vote column O or instead of having it multiplied out like that. John, your thoughts? Firstly, I think one of the virtues of that approach is that you'd still have multiple how-to-vote cards because you do want to be tapping into slightly different audiences. Uh, I would also say I think that plan works better if there are two minor right parties left standing. Now, three is definitely better than the current 12. Right. So I, I agree with you there. I do think the aspirational goal would be to narrow that down. I do think the nature of the minor right suggests that we probably need more than one because there's just there's going to be some people that do not fit in the same party, at least yet. Yep. And and do not see the situation as so dire as to give up half of their philosophy to, to make that work. But uh, I have said before, when people uh, approach me about to talk about the idea uh, of merging all the minor right parties, I said that suggested a halfway step would be you find a, the last couple of minor right parties left standing and you form something along the lines of a working coalition, which could involve a, a combined Senate ticket. I do think you'd still want to run separate campaigns because half of the virtue here is that you position yourself differently to tap into different uh, voting markets. Like realistically, the Lib Dems do appeal to some people who would never vote One Nation and vice versa. The One Nation does appeal to some people who wouldn't vote Lib Dems. So you, you want to continue tapping into your own markets and then hopefully building the overall share of that uh, vote. I, I think, I'm not sure if the idea, I'm not sure how much legs the idea has, but at least that idea isn't immediately laughed out of the water. I think that's the, <laughs> that's the virtue of that idea. Uh, Short-term merger is extremely unlikely, whereas what you've suggested there uh, at least has plausibility to it. By the way, I know we have to go to Ellie on this, but there is one big piece of news. So once we've had this topic, don't let uh, the show end. Okay, we will try not to go over time. We're trying to keep it to an hour show. Um, I think we've lost Ellie just now. She was having trouble with her internet connection and asked us to say goodbye for her. If she comes back, we'll bring her in. Um, but John, the uh, the big news. The big news. Well, the uh, well. The less big news, you'll be surprised to know Dutton is now leader of the Liberal Party. Oh, good. Um, the other interesting piece of news is that we now have the Teal Greens. Little Proud has rolled Barnaby Joyce. Barnaby Joyce is no Are longer. Are you serious? Just came through then, yeah. So David Little Proud is now the, the Teal leader of the, the, the Green National Party. Wow. And I don't know what's going I haven't read the actual article. I've just seen the headlines. But yes, Barnaby is no longer the leader of the Nats. And That's the, incredible. The, After their relative success at the federal election, they thought they needed to change direction and go with a moderate. Uh, insane. Well, I, uh, look, well, this certainly vindicates George Christensen's decision to leave the LNP. Um, the Liberal Party is, is broken. The National Party is broken. Um, 
uh, if you're a member, let me encourage you to stay there. I still think having missionaries to, um, to proselytize and evangelize uh, the, those parties and try and influence them for good and for light is, is good. Stay in those parties, please. I think they're much more uh, worthwhile time um, with your membership money. Uh, we, we need to pre-select better people in those parties, but do vote for and donate to freedom parties. Well, just on this last point then, and maybe this is about the hour mark, but um, sometimes people ask and people debate, you know, what's the best way to help uh, push the Overton window, push the discussion, push the politics in your direction? And I don't think there is one answer to that. There's several possible answers, minor party politics, major party politics, go into the media, go into academia, go into activism. Uh, and the answer to that is very individual specific. What best fits your temperament and your skill set? So the idea that every a good person should leave the major parties would be a terrible idea. Uh, but the idea that everyone, every good person from the minor party should all join the major parties, I think, is an equally terrible idea. We, we need people to do whatever you're good at, because if you're good at it and that's you enjoy right. it, and you, if you enjoy it, that's crucial. If you enjoy it, you'll keep doing it. And it's most important that you stay in the fight, stay in the movement. So find a part of it that you enjoy, that is good in your life, fits your life, uh, and then keep working on that. No, I 100% agree, John, and um, and that's probably uh, even an encouragement for viewers. If if somebody who you share values with has a different strategy on how to achieve and promote those values, then bless them, um, encourage them, pat them on the back, and and understand it, it's just like the uh, the the allies in World War II fighting an axis of evil. We can't all fight the same campaign on the same front in the same trench because we actually need to be fighting in different trenches and attacking on different fronts. Um, and, and that's an effective strategy to do. So trust that God or fate or whoever you believe in is, is directing them and, and you know, discuss and debate the, the benefits and merits of each strategy. Uh, but don't rag them out because they disagree with you on, at the end of the day, what is the best strategy. Uh, and I apologize if I'm giving anybody that impression. If you love some of the micro parties, then uh, you go for it. But I do think uh, we need to concentrate our efforts. And I do think that the micro parties uh, are a bad strategy. Um, and we, we need to focus a little bit better than, than we are without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, well, John, thank you so much for joining me in this episode. Um, look forward to doing it again. Ellie Melly, thank you so much for being part of um, this episode. Also, uh, not able to say goodbye right now because of internet trouble. Um, but that is the end of this episode of Palo Talk. And I'd like to, as I always do, thank the supporters of The Good Source and myself personally for um, your financial contributions to making this able to be my full-time job. Um, we are building a bigger team. I've started um, hiring a couple of staff casually. We can't afford to put them on full time right now. Um, but I would love you to be able to help pay them more. So if you can become a supporter, it might be as little as $10 a month or it might be $20 or $50 a month that you're able to invest in this mission to redeem the media in Australia. We need better information and we need better informed voters to overcome the influence of the mainstream media, or as I accurately call them, the lying harlot media. So that would be a, a really great favour and investment in the future of politics in this nation. Head to goodsource.news, and uh, right there you can sign up to be part of our newsletters. Very important that we have you in our mailing list, so when we lose contact in social media, we can tell you where to find us and you can get more of this content and, and conversations. Uh, but when you're on the website, click on support and please consider making a one-off or regular monthly um, donation. We have got so much that we are ready to do um, in the information and education space in Australia and we just need to be able to sustain the team to do it. Uh, but that is it for this episode. Please share it with your friends. Uh, thank you for everybody who joined us live in the comments. And uh, we will see you uh, Monday again uh, next week. Goodbye. Today, we need a special kind of courage. Not the kind needed in battle, but a kind which makes us stand up for everything that we know is right, everything that is true and honest. We need the kind of courage that can withstand the subtle corruption of the cynics so that we can show the world that we are not afraid of the future.